Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about activism on behalf of the basic human rights of Palestinians. Our guest is Nora Barrows Friedman. Nora Barrows Friedman is an associate editor at the Electronic Intifada and the author of in Our Power, U.S. Students Organized for Justice in Palestine. She is also the co-host of the Electronic Intifada podcast and co-host of The Brief Podcast. Nora Barrows Friedman, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for coming on and thank you for everything you've been doing. Um, you know, every time there's a big upsurge in activism and media attention in response to new outrages by the Israeli government, People say everything feels different this time, but it actually really does feel different every time. What what do you think? Are things changing? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, I, you know, there was so much that changed after the assaults on Gaza in 2014, um, which was a 51 day uh, series of attacks. It was a war on Gaza that obliterated entire families, um, thousands were killed, including 551 children, um, clinics were bombed, schools were bombed. It was, it was um, I think, a real um, instance where people around the world who maybe weren't so familiar with Israeli policies over the last 70 years um, had kind of a, 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 you know, an awakening. Um, and so then seven years after that, we saw what happened in Gaza, um, you know, earlier in May, um, 11 days of outrageously violent and vicious assaults on Palestinians uh, across Gaza, um, hundreds of airstrikes by Israeli warplanes, um, and, and the devastation was again just kind of this unbearable um, level of violence that uh, you know Palestinians of course would say is not is not anything different from what they've been experiencing for generations but I think because of the ubiquity of social media and the real sophistication of especially young people in Palestine who were documenting what was happening outside their windows and were able to stream in real time um, you know, what, what it was like, uh, you know, to the outside world. Um, I think that has precipitated this, this major shift um, in, you know, in, in kind of global consciousness about the Palestinian struggle, but especially in places like the U.S. I mean, I saw all over social media people who, you know, said that they had been kind of afraid to speak up on Palestine because they thought it would you know, ostracize them from their friends or family or, you know, their jobs, um, we're saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, this is, this is absolutely um, unbearable. And, and I'm gonna do my best to speak out as much as I can. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's so hard to, um, to, to be optimistic um, after such a brutal assault, like the ones that Palestinians were experiencing in Gaza. Um, and, and, you know, and, and of course, in the West Bank, um, I mean, this all happened because Israel was, um, was backing a settler movement that was trying to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from their neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Um, and then we had uprisings across uh, present-day Israel. So you had Palestinians that had been, you know, divided and conquered by Israeli policies um, given different identifications, given different like rights, um, you know, either some rights or no rights at all, depending on what your ID card said, um, coming together in unity. And, and I think, you know, what a lot of Palestinians were saying over the last few weeks was that um, this was Israel's worst nightmare, that there was so much unity, there was so much unified resistance and, and response to Israeli aggression and, and settler colonial violence, um, that I don't I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. And there and there have been big actions in Palestine, right? A general strike and yeah. and actions yeah. in solidarity around the world. Uh, how does right. how does the activism compare to 
years gone by? It's a great question. I yeah, definitely the the general strike, um, you know, which was held in in mid May, uh, was this phenomenal, you know, uh, unified um, stand that you know Palestinians you know, in, in occupied East Jerusalem, elsewhere in the West Bank and inside Israel itself, uh, were able to, to, to really kind of help grind Israel's economy to a halt, even just for 24 hours. Um, and that's also a, you know, a, a decades old tradition of Palestinians. There were general strikes, um, since the thirties, um, when, you know, Palestinians have, have, have said we are not going to be exploited. Our labor will not be exploited for the benefit of, of uh, the settler colony project. Um, and so the, the resumption of the, the general strike strategy uh, was, you know, as, as I said, like one, one more way that the Palestinians could show unity and actually like, you know, um, create a, a lot of worldwide solidarity. Um, there were also solidarity protests around the world at the same time. Um, you know, the international labor movement was right there uh, in solidarity with Palestinians. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, um, you know, during and, and after um, the attacks on Gaza. Uh, in in cities around the world, um, I mean, in in London, there were there were demonstrations, um, I believe, on on Saturday the twenty second, um, that were possibly the largest Palestine solidarity demonstrations in British history, um, and that's huge. Uh, it, and again, here all across the U.S., there were solidarity demonstrations um, on May fifteenth, and again on May twenty second. Um, and so, you know, this this uh, this this surge around the world of of heightened and strengthened solidarity with Palestinians um, is 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 wonderful and is is long overdue, um, and I think that's going to translate into um, kind of a, a, a strengthening of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that was called by Palestinian civil society in two thousand five. Um, you know, we're seeing lawmakers now using the term apartheid and, and ethnic cleansing, which are terms that are, you know, legitimate terms in the glossary of you know, what, what Israel has been doing to Palestinians since 1947. Um, and I, I think, I, you know, I think we, we can't, now that the bombs have stopped, we can't just sit back and, and take it easy and like, you know, turn our heads um, we have to keep the pressure up. We have to demand that lawmakers um, uh, work to stop, not condition aid, but to stop aid from the U.S. to Israel. Um, I mean, the Biden administration is considering a $735 million military package um, to Israel to resupply these uh, just extraordinarily uh, devastating um, weapons that the Israeli military has been using, has used, and will use again on Palestinians. We have to stop that that flow of capital. We have to stop the flow of arms yeah. um, to this apartheid. It, state. It, it is a little bizarre, isn't it, Nora Barrows Friedman, that the United States gives some three point eight billion dollars of free money a yeah. year to the Israeli government, and then the most radical bill in Congress, at least up until recent days, uh, was from Congresswoman McCollum, which was essentially if. Yeah. You're going to imprison and torture children. You should use someone else's money for that bit and use the free money from yeah. the United States for other sort of general apartheid maintenance. It, is that isn't that? <laughs> it's pretty weak, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good step. It's a really good step, and of course, it's mostly a symbolic bill because you're not going to get you know Congress uh, enough Congress people. Uh, in the House and then, of course, in the Senate to, to back that kind of legislation. But it signifies a really important sea change that there are Congress people um, right now, elected lawmakers, Betty McCollum, who isn't even, you know, one of the most progressive um, members of Congress, uh, listening to her constituents and listening to the human rights uh, and activism groups that are coming to her office and saying, look, we have to put a, a, a you know, a wrench in the gear um, right now, this is this is completely unconscionable. 
Um, and she's willing to listen and she's willing to draft legislation that takes a step. You know, obviously, as you said, you know, it's it's not it's not uh, it doesn't have teeth in the way that we would like to see. But it is important that McCollum is taking this stand, um, that she's organizing other members of Congress uh, to support these kinds of bills. And, you know, I mean, we couldn't have dreamed of this kind of bill, you know, being introduced in the Congress even five years yeah. ago. Um, so it really is important that, you know, that, that we um, keep working with our lawmakers to, to draft this kind of legislation, to recruit more Congress members and senators to back this kind of legislation, and eventually, um, to, you know, to demand, uh, to demand that this aid be cut and... and we should not ever be funding an apartheid system, uh, an ethnocentric, white supremacist, um, you know, violent settler colonial apartheid state. We, we can't. We, we cannot. But of course, we're talking about the United States. The United States has very, sh you know, a lot of shared values with other states um, that, that employ the same tactics that, that have been used in this country for 500 years against indigenous people, against enslaved black people, you know, and, and, and through the Jim, Jim Crow laws, um, which was, you know, legitimized apartheid. Yeah. Um, and up till today, when we see what's happening in the streets of Ferguson, for example, uh, in the streets of Oakland, here where I am, um, we have a lot to do. And, and we, one of the steps toward collective liberation has to be to stop the flow of capital from, from this settler colony to a different settler colony, um, a client state in the Middle East that, that does the bidding of U.S. imperial there, no there were, as you know, resolutions put in, I, as far as I know, for the first time ever in both houses of the U.S. Congress to stop yeah. this particular weapons sale, uh, and, and as yeah. far as I know, not brought to a vote, even in committee. Uh, yeah. But any, is there any indication that any member of Congress will take any step to, to sort of to commit to voting against more money? Because it's the free money that's being used to buy the weapons, right? Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, as you said, three point eight billion dollars a year plus these like, you know, added on bonus weapons deals. Um, you know, when when that money I mean, just imagine what three point eight billion dollars a year could do for uh, the school systems here in California, for universal health care, for pre-K, for, um, you know, uh, uh, you know we, I mean, we're, we're heading up to wildfire season here on the West Coast. Imagine if we um, if we could throw that money into ecological restoration and prevention of devastating devastation of wildfires, but instead we're allocating this money to a nuclear armed apartheid settler colonial state, um, and and you know when you when you talk about this to lawmakers. Um, you know, there is a little bit of wiggle room, I think more and more lawmakers are like yeah you know that would be really great if we had a little bit more wiggle room to do you know social services to fund yeah. you know school programs and lunch programs in our school districts um it it is going to take a lot more work and a lot more pressure from constituents um to to get them to recommit to to shifting that money into into these programs instead of giving it to yeah. israel i mean you're talking about uh, you know congress people uh, who are every day being lobbied by, you know, APAC, the, the large, the, you know, one of the largest lobbies on Capitol Hill, to keep that money flowing. Um, they, they, they threaten lawmakers that they'll be, um, you know, uh, uh, primaried or, sure. you know, not elected in the next term if they, if they take a stand on Palestinian human rights. So I think that we have a long way to go, but, but, you know, the groundswell of, um, of resistance, you know, in the American left, I think, to, to this, you know, this like status quo of, of the U.S. is, you know, just like giving gargantuan amounts of money to Israel to kill Palestinians. I think it's, it's growing and eventually, um, hopefully soon, I mean, it can't come soon enough, no. 
um, lawmakers will have to do the right and, thing. And of course, the so-called military aid to Israel is the biggest, but it's not just yeah. Israel and it's not just a few countries. It's most countries right. on the planet getting free money yeah. uh, for their militaries. Right. So it, it is a chunk right. of funds if you were to move it somewhere else. Um, can you imagine? <laughs> well, I, I imagine it every yeah. day, and but I haven't made it happen yet. Uh, we, yeah. Uh, but but what but what I've been noticing, you know, I don't watch television. I get you know the best little clips of U.S. television through social media, yeah. like I get all the powerful yeah. videos from activists through social media, yeah. and I've just seen more good clips and and things I can't imagine having seen in years gone by. Yeah. And people who watch TV all day tell me, well, ninety percent of it is still awful, and and, and yet the good it is. bits <laughs> is, is that right? Is ninety percent of it still awful? Because the good bits are I mean, so much better than I think they ever yeah. were. You know, I think especially um, since the beginning of the attacks on Gaza this last round, uh, you were seeing kind of a crack in the dam in some of the mainstream corporate yeah. outlets. You know, I'm, not, I'm talking about a slight crack and a huge dam, but, but you know, you were seeing um, uh, finally uh, some anchors were, were saying the apartheid word, you know, we're like calling it, a, a, you know, an apartheid and apartheid. Um, you were you were seeing, um, you know, some reporters really talk about um, the violence that is being inflicted on Palestinians. Not when, not just when the cameras are are running in Gaza, but every day for the last seventy three years. Um, that's encouraging. We again, we still have to do so much more. And I think that yeah, with the you know with the ubiquity of social media, um, I think more and more people. Are, are turning off their televisions and turning on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram Live and, you know, getting getting information straight from, you know, from Palestinians themselves. And I think that's been uh, that's been phenomenal to see, yeah. um, you know, really. I mean, just as in, you know, in in other instances of, of wars and occupations, um, the people on the ground being able to tell their own stories is often the most powerful way to get you know media across. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been really encouraging to see. And again, Palestinians have like, they've always, they've always been telling their stories. They've always been shouting, you know, like we, we are here, we have a narrative and, and what's, what's being reported on CNN or MSNBC is, is exactly the opposite of what is actually happening on the ground. Um, but now with, with, with these platforms becoming so accessible and available to people, um, it's really, it's really put a lot of power back into Palestinians. It, hands. it seems like there have been significant improvements in at least on at least one topic in U.S. major corporate media, and that's Black Lives Matter. And if that's right, yeah. the lesson seems to be you need good videos of particular victims and you need protests, disruptive protests that get in the way of routine. Yeah. And it seems like we're we're getting a bit of both of those on, on the demand yeah. for rights in Palestine, right? I mean, is that That's is right. that the model we should be trying to to build? Yeah, I mean, it's also really it's it's really difficult too because you know uh, it's you don't want to Palestinians shouldn't have to film their the the violence that be that's being inflicted on them in order to get people to believe them. You know, like uh, like people should just they should know because this has been documented for so yeah. long. It's not a mystery what's what's been happening to Palestinians, and it's it's a sad state of affairs that that people here in the U.S. didn't believe black people when they said that they were being um, you know uh, just hunted by police in, until there was video evidence. Um, so. You know that the, the the documentation, of course, matters, and it, and it of course is is an important part of um, of you know uh, garnering support and 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 bringing evidence to courtrooms now. You know, with the Derek Chauvin trial, of course. Um, but but it, it it you know I, I think. Um, I think the narrative is is finally changing. It's 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 absurd and heartbreaking that it had to come to you know people having to turn on their you know their phones and record these acts of violence that that were happening all the time. Um, but 
again, but this is this is citizen journalism now, and this is you know, and, and there have been so many parallels drawn between um, the the liberation, um, the the struggle for liberation in Palestine, and the struggle for Black liberation here yeah. in the U.S. Um, and and uh, you know, delegations. Um, of uh, Black Lives Matter activists to Palestine, working with Palestinians in conjunction to 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 under, you know to understand you know the intersections of of these liberation struggles has been absolutely pivotal um, for the struggles for on both on you know both here in the U.S. and and in Palestine, um, and that's also something that the Israeli government and and Israel lobby groups are are kind of you know really freaked out about. They're in a yeah. panic. Because they know that if the Palestinian struggle is further universalized, then that um, also shines a spotlight on on Israel's uh, policies, and and the, the the connection between Israel's policies and the U.S.'s policies, and the, again, like the shared values of of violence, uh, state violence, and military violence, and racism, and discrimination. Um, this is a universal struggle, and and um, and so it's it's very clear. It, and so you know, documenting this yeah. um, is delicate but powerful. I think the the freak out is is real, and the pushback is as fierce as ever, and the accusations, yeah. often false, of anti-Semitism and the censorship. You've been reporting on this. There's media censorship. There's academic censorship. There's censorship yeah. by these big tech companies that we've somehow empowered as our guardians of, 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 you know, proper thought. (laughs) What's the, who's winning in this uh, field? Oh God, that's, uh, that's hard to say. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, the, you know, Silicon Valley uh, is, is, is winning um, by being able to, you know, throw their terms of service, their arbitrary terms of service around. um, And, you know, they are, they they have become elevated as the arbiters of free speech, especially in academic um, settings. So, you know, it's just been outrageous to see how Israel lobby groups can just make phone calls or send, you know, batches of emails to Zoom or YouTube or Google Meets or whatever platform it is um, and and say, hey, you know, there's a there's an event featuring Palestinians talking about censorship <laughs> literally this has happened palestinians talking about being censored um and we don't like you know we don't like them they're terrorists they um you know if if, if they threat the, these israel lobby groups threaten these companies with, with federal lawsuits saying that um if they give these people a platform that they could be held liable for uh for violations of the material support for terrorism clause under the usa patriot act of fine piece of legislation circa 2003. Um, and unfortunately, these companies are very scared of any litigation. Uh, it means a lot of you know money and time spent. So it's easier to just cancel the events from their platforms. Um, and uh, so this has happened time and time again. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in this in this period of, of virtual learning, um, you know, entire uh, the, the entire University of California system and the California State University system um, have both kind of handed over the reins to Zoom. And it's been it's been really uh, a struggle for anti-racist um, academics and, and organizers and students to have um, any sort of modicum of like you know, free, I mean, I thought that the campus was supposed to be the, you know, open marketplace of ideas sort of thing, but not when it comes to Palestine um, or criticizing Israel. So, and that's, and then we see censorship happening all over Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram um, of Palestinians, you know, just having their content or their entire accounts removed. Um, So it's, it's not, it's not great, but, you know, there are fantastic lawyers on our side who are, you know, hopefully um, able to, you know, with some sort of legal, you know, vehicle, um, do some sort of counter pressure <laughs> to these campaigns, 
to these corporations. You know, those, uh, those of us trying to oppose everybody's wars, including U.S. wars, are have for a long time been pretty impressed with the or organizing of students in the United States yeah. about Israeli wars, albeit U.S. funded yeah. Israeli war. Uh, yeah. And sometimes you see students get active around Israeli wars and turn against U.S. wars as well. Um, yeah. But why why has there been such success and how can there be more uh, it, with organizing mm. students about Israeli wars in the United States? Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's actually a lot happening on campuses um, despite you know, these like shenanigans by Israel lobby groups to silence and censor and um, suppress activism on campuses for Palestinian rights. Um, students these days are, uh, you know, a lot savvier and a lot more courageous than, you know, even like my generation. Um, I think that that they they are just they're so strong and so well informed um, and they are under, you know, like I was talking about before, I mean, the, the links between the, the Black Lives Matter movement and the struggle for Palestinian liberation, like, they are so strong that on any campus around the U.S., when you see students, you know, holding a protest for, um, for Palestinian rights or, you know, that there will be a Black Lives Matter contingent there, um, when you see a, a protest on campus or some sort of action protesting um, police violence either on campus or in that community where the, where the university is, there will always be a Palestinian, Palestinian rights group, uh, campus Palestinian rights yeah. group, marching alongside them. I mean, the struggle is so interlinked and so connected um, that, you know, when, so when, you know, students who aren't involved in any sort of activism thing see that Black Lives Matter students are are marching alongside students for justice in Palestine, you know that makes the connection very right. visible. Um, and you know, and with you know, students again, students are incredibly smart right now, and they are taking on these uh, these pressure campaigns, these harassment campaigns by Israel lobby groups who are trying to get the, you know, if they can't do it, they'll, they'll try and pressure the administration of universities to clamp down on Palestine solidarity activism. Yeah. And students are like, okay, fine, go ahead. You know what? Like, try yeah. it. Um, there are fantastic legal organizations like Palestine Legal that is dedicated to protecting and defending students who are involved in Palestinian rights issues. Um, and, and, you know, I just I see so much courage and strength from these students every single day who are facing just the most incredible smear campaigns you can imagine, um, taking them head on and and not giving them any legitimacy and, and just marching forward. Very good to hear. We've been speaking with Nora Barrows Friedman, who is an associate editor at the Electronic Intifada, a wonderful place. You should check it out. We will have a link up at Talk worldradio.org. Uh, Nora, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Anytime. Thank you so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.